Good morning. My name is Bhuvan Apurvajha. This is the Indian Express Explained. Let's get started. Three topics I have for you. Number one is to do with Sant Mirabai Janmotsav. The 525th Sant Mirabai Janmotsav is being observed today. The Prime Minister will be in Mathura attending a program. So we must look at uh, Sant Mirabai. And more importantly, going a step further, we should look at the Bhakti movement too. And more specifically, the two schools of thought of Bhakti movement. Okay, so we'll discuss that. That's agenda number one. Number two, we'll go ahead and look at River Narmada because, uh, well, uh, the judiciary has observed something adverse about uh, the proceedings that are happening in and around River Narmada. Okay, so from the geography perspective, very, very important. And number three is an article from the Indian Express that talks about the Esekibo dispute. Okay, so when you talk of disputes, that are around the world. So you have many disputes that have been in the news. So Nagorno Karabakh has been in the news. There has been a dispute in the Sahel region. We can talk of the Rafa border crossing, the Israel Gaza, Gaza crisis. Russia Ukraine has been a source of dispute, right? So you have these disputed areas, okay? And UPSC frequently asks those questions. So we should look at this in detail, and we'll go a step further, like we always do, and not just understand this dispute, but another nearby dispute that is just happening, say, a few hundred kilometers from this place. Both of them will be the agenda of this class. Okay? Chalo, let's get started. If you have any doubts, you'll reach out to me on my uh, Telegram channel. Meanwhile, you go ahead and approach this particular Telegram uh, ID where I will be uploading the PDF of the entire lecture. Okay? I also upload questions regularly and source materials that are of relevance to you. Not everything is flooded. You know, not everything is of relevance to you. So, uh, I pick and choose, but I make sure that I offer value to those who are a part of this group. I suggest you become a part of this group too. All right. Let's look at the first topic. The Sant Mirabai Janmotsav. Okay. Morning, your neighbor, coder, Yathendra. Guys, thank you so much for joining. Welcome. Good morning. Okay. So the 525th birth anniversary of Sant Mirabai is being observed today. Right. So here is this painting that you see. It's a Kangra painting, in fact. Okay. We'll discuss Kangra painting too uh, in another class. But this is a Kangra painting of Sant Mirabai. Right. So what is the story of Sant Mirabai? So you must have all heard. Her story uh, is of immense and unconditional devotion to the divine. Okay. And Sant Mirabai is known for her say compositions. But how many of those compositions are actually hers? And how many of those compositions are say drafted or composed by those who, who have followed her over the years? Okay, so let's look at it. She's a Hindu mystic poet and a Krishna devotee, okay, who lived in the 16th century, a well-known Bhakti saint. So she's associated with the Bhakti school, right? Now, when you go ahead and understand the Bhakti movement, is the, is the chat open? Yes, okay. Manju, good morning, good morning, welcome. So let's go ahead and understand, before I go ahead and tell you about, say, Sant Mirabai, let's quickly go ahead and understand few details about say the origin of bhakti movement okay so when you look at the origin what you realize is that it was a reactionary movement against the say prevalent social order okay reactionary movement against the prevalent social order of that time okay now you find that this can be roughly categorized into two ideological schools of thought for those of you who are watching this for the first time it will be a relatively easy discussion. For those of you who have studied this previously, well, you will find this is a revision of what you have already known. Okay. So, you can go ahead and categorize this into two schools of thought. One is the Nirguna school of thought. Okay. The ideological school of thought. Right. You must have heard of this word, Nirgun. Okay. And then you have the Saguna school of thought. Two types. We will quickly understand, say, the difference between both of them. Okay. Chalo. Let's do it very quickly. Let me get uh, green. Green will be better. Okay. So the Nirguna school of thought. Now what does it stand for? So this was those poets, those saints who said that, well, the God is formless. He is beyond any form. Okay. There is not a particular form to God. There is not a particular version to God. Okay. The God does is beyond any attributes. It is the one and the all. That is what they essentially hinted at, okay, which means you can understand that they opposed idol worship, since God is formless, which means obviously, right, 
आइडल्स होल्ड नो मीनिंग फॉर द निर्गुना स्कूल ऑफ थॉट राइट ओके दे ऑल्सो रिजेक्टेड द सुप्रीमेसी ऑफ द प्रेवलेंट सोशल ऑर्डर ओके दे रिजेक्टेड द सुप्रीमेसी ऑफ द सोशल ऑर्डर ऑफ दैट टाइम अगेन बिकॉज दिस वॉज द रिएक्शनरी मूवमेंट सो यू फाउंड दैट वेल दे अपोज द वेरी कॉज दैट मेड देम गो टूवर्ड्स दैट मूवमेंट ओके and they said that well your interaction with god is totally personal right personal interaction with god or the divine right so straight away when this is happening when they say that well your relationship with god is personal well it obviously means that they are opposed to any sort of rituals any sort of say a class a priest class yes they were opposed to them so you can say they opposed the priestly class right so you find the most obvious examples of this are say guru nanak and uh, sant kabir okay the nirguna school of thought now what are the saguna school of thought so exactly what the nirguna said but with some changes right they said well god has forms so they composed verses and poems right that said that well god has a certain form right it is not formless bulbul good morning how are you welcome welcome theek okay. hai now you have say prevalent of this the best example of this i can give you is say tulsidas okay or say chaitanya right now what did the saguna school of thought also say right they said that well you need because god has a form so they were obviously for idol worship they said that well it's just not personal there needs to be rituals involved right so the priestly class they were in favor of them you see minor differences but then it changes your whole perspective of how the say a bhakti school of movement developed right and they preached surrender to the god surrender to the treaty surrender to the divine right so you have these two, two schools of thought saguna and nirguna okay don't worry if uh, you haven't written this down you can take a screenshot or else i will be sharing this pdf on my uh, telegram channel anyways right so let's go forward now let's see so sant mirabai now she is mentioned in bhaktamal this is a very important text in fact very very important text and what does this text do what is bhaktamal all about so it's a set of poems okay or say compositions that talk about various bhakti saints various bhakti saints of that time well their mention is in this text called bhaktamal now this was written by das right so a very seminal text of that time had mentioned uh, sant mirabai that time okay now mirabai is credited with millions of devotional hymns in the praise of lord krishna okay but the key thing that you should know is that say be, beyond 2 3 5 5 explicit uh, like absolutely sure poems okay the rest are actually interpretations or say hymns or versions that have been written down by her followers over the ages yeah the original ones are just little far and few we'll discuss the original ones one of them i'm sure you must have heard of uh, uh, during your time theek hai Anmol, good morning. How are you? Correct. Yathendra, focus on knowledge, focus on love. True, absolutely. So, majority written down in the 18th century by the scholars who followed Sant Mirabai, right? So, let's look at why she is considered an enigma. What is an enigma? Someone who is very mysterious. Okay. So, why is Sant Mirabai considered so mysterious? Firstly, you find that well, obviously, lack of texts. Number one. Okay. Now. her poems are composed of lyrical padas or metric verses which bhasha or which language were her poems conducted in okay braj bhasha which you find mostly spoken in the braj area or this western up region around say mathura vrindavan okay so the braj bhasha uh, the uh, poems were conducted uh, written about her and in rajasthani okay now she is credited with hundreds of verses but academics disagree on how many of them were written by meera herself you see this is the thing 
So, so many poems, so many verses, so many compositions are actually credited to her. But she is actually credited actually. You know, what uh, historians have written down is just few. Firstly, have you heard of this? Ram Ratan Dhan Payo. Payo Ji Mere. Ram Ratan Dhan Payo. This particular composition. Yes, this is written by her. Then you have Rag Govind, Govind Tika. Rag Sora Tha, Meera Ki Malhar, Meera Padavali, huh? Narsi Ji Ki Mayara. They are her original compositions. Along with say, Payo Ji Mene Ram Ratan Dhan Payo. Yes, this song is obviously very very famous. famous. You must have heard of it some place or the other. Okay? Many classical uh, say uh, people have gone ahead and attempted this song. Okay? Now her poetry also appears in Prem Ambodh Poti, a book credited to Guru Gobind Singh. Right? It's one of the 16 ancient bhakti saints essential to Sikhism also. You see? So she finds relevance not just in Hinduism but also in Sikhism. Right? And thus you find that 525th anniversary of Sant Mirabai that is being observed today is of special relevance. Because again she talks of devotion, a feeling of oneness with the Lord. Yes? She stands for joining communities together. Right? And her, her relationship with Lord Krishna, you find that she's not just written poems on Lord Krishna, but also on Radha. Right? So it's a very pure relationship. It's a relationship of unconditional devotion to the deity. And thus she finds relevance. And thus you find that the 525th anniversary of Sant Mirabai, Sant Mirabai Janmotsav is being observed today. Okay? Chalo. As we always do, you will answer questions for me. Anmol, I'm good. How are you? Welcome, welcome. Good morning. Okay. How many of the above are true for Bhaktamal, the text that we just discussed right now? Statement 1, it gives an account of various Bhaktas. Statement 2, written in Braj Bhasha. Statement 3, written by Nabhadas. Okay, let me know your answers in the chat box. Question number 2, with reference to Nirguna ideological thought of the Bhakti movement, identify the incorrect statement for me. Yes, they emphasized on a God which was beyond all forms. B, the rejected practice of idolatry. C. Kabir, Tulsidas and Chaitanya were associated with this school of thought and D. They rejected the supremacy of the caste system. Okay? Now, if you have uh, followed the lecture closely, these questions will be very, very easy for you. Okay? Leave your answers for me in the comment box after the class ends. Meanwhile, in 60 seconds or less, this closes. Huh? The Hindi batch begins this uh, in just one hour from now. Okay? The English batch starts tomorrow. And the bilingual batch starts day after. Key time, you know. Go ahead, look at the course deliverables. If you are someone who is preparing and if you haven't sought help up until now or if you are unhappy with wherever you have signed up, right, there is still hope for next year, firstly. Okay, there is time for you to go ahead, course correct and prepare in the right direction. And what is the right direction? Adequate conceptual focus. Making sure that you don't have to go by road based learning but understand the concepts. Okay, and follow it up with adequate question solving, uh, say, ability, both in the prelims and the mains. That is the entire focus of the prelims to interview initiative, of which I am a part of. I will be taking care of the geography, of uh, CSAT, reading comprehension, international relations, among other subjects for you. My esteemed colleagues will be taking a look at the other subjects for you. And the entire hand-holding process from prelims up until interviews is a part of it. Right? So go ahead and sign up for it. Decide on which language you want to get tutored in. Okay, I am associated with the English and the English batch, right? And when you do decide to sign up, use the code BA Live, as that assures you that you get a substantial discount. But from my perspective, what's relevant to me is that you get allotted to my batch. And so thus your preparation becomes my responsibility, our responsibility here at Study IQ, right? I hope many of you consider joining this. Meanwhile, we'll move on to the second topic for the day and take a look at River Narmada. Okay. Illegal construction along Narmada River, the High Court, High Court grants Madhya Pradesh government more time. Fine. But let's understand River Narmada very closely now. So the largest, say, a west flowing river that you find uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Okay. Flows in a rift valley. Yes, Vindhya and Satpura. You have the rift valley that flows, that is created in the middle and from which you have two major rivers that are passing. Right. And then they go ahead and drain into the Gulf of Khambat, right? So you have Narmada and Tapi that flow through a rift valley and eventually 
drain into the Gulf of Khambat. Recently, by the way, you have had vanadium deposits that have been found here. And well, what was the reason you found vanadium deposits in the Gulf of Khambat? Well, because of the centuries, the years and years of uh, deposition that the two rivers have been bringing. Right? So, once again, the largest flowing river of the peninsular India, where does it start from? Well, a small reservoir in the Amar Kantak known as the Narmada Kund. Okay? Now, which states does it flow through? Firstly, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, okay, and Gujarat. Now, if you have ever, say, gone ahead and understood your geography, you would have gone, say, Kach Kathiawad. But more importantly, in this area, yes, you have something called the Gujarat Plain, roughly this area, huh? the Gujarat Plain. So, what happens? Once the river enters the Gujarat Plain, the Narmada River enters the Gujarat Plain, okay, it shows some bit of meandering. Contrary to, say, what you might be knowing so far that west flowing rivers don't meander, well, Narmada does meander some bit. And thus, you find that riverine islands are also formed. Okay? When you talk about the riverine islands, so one riverine island that even straight away comes to any student's mind is Majuli, huh? on river Brahmaputra in Assam. But then there are several other riverine islands that you need to be aware of. Just on river Nar uh, Brahmaputra also, you have two more riverine islands that uh, as a student you must be aware of. Okay? For example, in Brahmaputra, right? So, half the janta will be telling you about Majuli. Yes, absolutely correct. But then you also find that there are other riverine islands such as Umananda. Okay? And then the third that has been formed on a sandbar of the uh, river Brahmaputra called the Molai forest. Right? Now, you must have all of, uh, all of you must have heard of this name, Jadav Payeng, uh, the forest man of India who single-handedly created a forest on a sandbar of river uh, Brahmaputra. That forest now is known as Molai forest, which is now considered to be a river in island. Right? So, similarly, on Narmada, you have two types of uh, two uh, river in islands. Okay? First, let's understand them. Number one is Mandhata, on which you have the famous Jyotirling. So, in Hinduism, you have 12 Jyotirlings that are famous across India. Okay? And Omkareshwar is on river Narmada, okay? on Mandhatta river in island. And similarly, you have Kabirwad, which is in Gujarat. So, when the river enters the Gujarat plains, it starts to meander and thus it forms another river in island called Kabirwad. Okay? So, remember, Brahmaputra, three river in islands, right now you learnt, even though we are discussing Narmada. And Narmada has two major riverine islands. Uh, one more that you must tell me about in the comment box. Okay, it also has three. I have told you two. Tell me the third one. Right. So it is one of the rivers that flows in a rift valley. This is what the books are absolutely telling you about that you have a rift valley created here. And on that, you have two rivers that prominently flow Narmada and Tapi. Okay. Now, it has numerous waterfalls. If you have been to Jabalpur recently, you will find that the Dhuadar Falls will be in full might. Yes. You also have Bheda Ghat that is formed there. Okay. Important again. So, the major uh, uh, tributaries, the Tava tributary is the largest tributary of Narmada. Then you have Barna, Hiran and Orsang. Okay. Now, what is the Rift Valley? So, you might be asking that. What's for the uh, freshers, for the beginners? Well, look at it as a fracture. That is it. Rift Valley is nothing but if this is a continental or an oceanic plate, whatever it might be, here is a zone of weakness that is getting created. And thus it is a fracture. It is almost like you have a depression on both sides. Huh? Raised platform on two sides and a depression getting created in the middle. Right? So a landform whose formation is triggered by a geological rift or fault, a zone of weakness. And thus you have an elongated lowland in the middle of mountain ranges. This depression that is getting created. Yes, grabbins, but nothing but a valley having a fault of two or more sides set up by the divergence of tectonic plates. So, for example, in your oceans, you have ridge, mid-Atlantic ridge that you must have read about, where your sea floor spreading is happening. When you learn about the sea floor spreading concept, uh, Harry Hess, 1960, you will realize that, well, it is the mid-Atlantic oceanic ridge that is the best example to understand that. A similar mechanism is being observed in a rift valley where you have divergence and a grabbing create, created. Okay. Murshida, good morning. How are you? Welcome. Welcome. Absolutely clear about river Narmada. 
If it is clear, then well, these questions should be relatively easy for you. Go ahead and answer them for me. Molai Forest on Brahmaputra, Umananda on Subarna Rekha, Mandhata on Narmada. Identify the incorrectly matched. And question number four, a PYQ from the year 2013 for you. Okay. The river Narmada flows to the west, while most other large peninsula rivers flow to the east. Why does it happen? Statement one, it occupies the linear rift valley. Statement two, flows between Vindhya Satpura. Statement three, the land slopes to the west from central India. Identify the correct answer. Okay, let me know your answers for this too in the comment box. Meanwhile, I'll give you a hint for this. Okay, look at the effect, which is the flow of the river in the western direction. Okay, and then identify the cause for it. Okay, what exactly is the cause? The direct cause. Okay, that's your biggest hint that I can provide for you to answer this question. It's a cause effect question if you analyze it correctly. Okay, before I go forward very quickly, this set of 18 books that Study IQ IS has come up with, which is by the way very well received in the student community, is on sale. Okay. You can go ahead and get these set of 18 books in either uh, English language or Hindi language. Okay. And this comes to you, well, at this price, but if you go ahead and apply the code B-A-L-I-V-E, right, what you find is once again, I have a gift for you, a post Diwali gift as well. You get a good discount on that, right? So go ahead. If you are uh, still looking for the right books to go ahead and supplement your preparation, well, the Study IQ books are most recommended. Take care. Now let's look at this article from the Indian Express, my friends. Venezuela government fans dispute with Guyana over oil rich region. Huh? So another dispute, which means as civil service aspirants, huh? very, very important for you to consider. Well, what is this dispute about? First, let's go ahead and understand the location. So here it is, South America. Okay. On one side, you have Suriname, India's close friend, huh? President Chandrika Prasad Santokhi. Now, the neighbor of Suriname, Guyana, is the area of interest. And what you find is that Venezuela is now claiming ownership of Guyanese territory. Okay. So how can it be? How can a nation randomly claim territory of another country? Well, because it is disputed. Now, wherever there is a dispute, it is a direct byproduct of colonialism. Yes. It's often colonialism that went and messed it up completely. So let's go ahead and understand. Plus, you'll also realize how in international diplomacy, your decisions should be taken by you. It should not be taken by your representative because there are no good friends in diplomacy. Okay, there are no permanent friends, no permanent enemies in diplomacy. So the best example of that, a nation giving ownership of its sovereignty to another entity and thus giving rise to a dispute is how one can best summarize this problem. Okay, let's go ahead and understand this. So, this particular territory, Venezuela considers Esequibo as its own. This entire red mark that you see, which is a part of Guyana right now, but Venezuela considers its own. Why? Because it was part of it during the Spanish colony. Right? Now, after the Spanish colonialism ended there, you had the disputed boundary that was decided by arbitrators from Britain, Russia and the US. Here it is. So the three came together. Huh? UK comes together, USA comes together, and Russia come together to decide on the fate of Esequibo, which would ideally have been with Venezuela. Okay? But Venezuela is, has broken off diplomatic relationships with Britain. So Venezuela does not like UK. So what happens? Now their interests are represented by the United States. Now, as soon as United States comes in, you find that, well, Venezuelan interests take a back seat. Okay. Venezuelan uh, officials contend that the Americans and Europeans conspired to cheat their country out of the land and argue that a 1966 agreement nullified the original arbitration. There it is. The country gave up its, say, right of sovereignty to another entity and paid the price for it. Why? Because they had broken off diplomatic relationship with, the, uh, with Great Britain. And thus you find, now this area has become a source of contention. But Venezuela didn't really care much about this. Up until recently, 
when Exxon Mobil went ahead and declared that they had found huge oil reserves. There now, the problem now suddenly becomes much more relevant because, well, paisa is involved, money is involved, okay, oil is involved. And thus you find that now the Venezuelan government under President uh, Nicolas Maduro, okay, he has gone ahead and said, well, let's have a referendum, okay, and we are going to claim ownership of a land that originally belonged to us. Meanwhile, the Guyanese people are like, what, what is this happening, okay? Why is this happening? Well, because obviously you found oil there. And oil means money, it means economic progress, it means, well, going forward in life. Realize this. So this is the entire crux of the essay quibo crisis that is developing between two nations, Venezuela and Guyana. Now talking of Guyana, okay? What you find is Guyana also has its land eaten or you can consider to be claimed by Venezuela right now. But when you consider the Tigri crisis, so you see this here. Huh? So this Tigri crisis is also developing there now. It's disputed by Guyana and Suriname. Here it is. Now in this case, what is happening is that this is essentially considered to be Surinamese territory. Okay, here Guyana has been occupying another nation and in Esequibo, they are looking at the possibility of being occupied by Venezuela. Okay, so the hunters become the hunted. This is essentially happening. So Tigri area disputed by Guyana and Suriname. Okay, now three rivers, Upper Quarantine River, the Corona River and the Kutari River. This whole area, three rivers are there, which is why it is called as the New River Triangle. Now, since 1969, this area is being controlled by Guyana. Okay, you had a major conflict that happened there. And so in 1971, both the countries agreed, well, that they will have talks over the issue, they will resolve it bilaterally. But up until this date, up until 2023, you find Guyana has positioned its security forces here. So it hasn't held up its own commitment. Okay, so two important uh, crises that you learnt about today. Number one is the SA Quibo. And number two is the Tigri area. Okay. Now you consider say the other places that are in the news. So for example, the Rafa border crossing. Huh? Been in the news recently. Okay. You are looking at a crisis that has developed in the Sahel region. Okay. There is a crisis that is happening in Myanmar. Okay. You have Syrian crisis that is developing. You have the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So an entire PDF. What I have done is prepared an entire PDF for you, simplifying all of these crises and I will be uploading that on my Telegram channel by this evening. Okay, so if you haven't already, go ahead, sign up with my Telegram channel and well, this will be a one-stop PDF that will give you the entire information about the different crises that have developed in geopolitics in the year 2023. Got it? Perfect. Okay, chalo. So make sure that you know this, Esequibo and Tigri. Okay, Esequibo between Venezuela and Guyana and here Guyana and Suriname. Okay, my friends, let's go ahead and answer this. The Rafa border crossing connects which of the above? So you must have all uh, been following the Israel-Palestine crisis, no? Let's check your geography. Okay, Gaza-Egypt, Gaza-Jordan, Gaza-Israel. Let me know your answers in the comment box. And question six. The Liptako Gurma region lies on the border of which country countries? Another disputed area, disputed uh, problem happening here. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Not that you need it, but well, this is to do with the Sahel region that you all have been reading about in the northern African continent. Okay, so let me know your answers. The Liptako Gurma region happening in which of the countries or involves which of the countries? Correct, Bulbul. You are absolutely correct in your assessment. Confident uh, law class, good morning, how are you? Thanks, thank you. Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali or all of the above. Right? Okay. So go ahead, if you have any particular doubts, any particular comments, observations, feedbacks, if you didn't like the class, if you like the class, if you have any particular suggestions for me, reach out to me on my Telegram, uh, Instagram channel. I'll be more than happy to go ahead and solve your doubt for you or take your criticism or your praise on board. Okay? Right? Let's look at the questions of yesterday. Yesterday was a deep dive on loss and uh, damage concept. A very, very important class, especially from the mains perspective. Today's topics more or less prelims oriented, but yesterday's class, the loss and damage concept is extremely relevant. 
So which of the following publishes the adaptation gap report? Very, very important. Was in the news. UNEP only. Okay. Just A. Which of the following is not a part of the alliance of small island states? Why are they relevant? Because, well, when you talk about the loss and damage concept, it was this particular group that started voicing their concerns in the year 1991. And thus you had their concerns that was accommodated in Rio 1992, which gave rise to my UNFCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which gave rise to conference of parties, which now is discussing the loss and damage concept and a transitional committee has been formed, which will be giving its uh, report in COP28. Okay. If I had to go ahead and explain it in an algorithm to you, this is how it is. Okay. Don't worry if you are still getting confused in this. I have planned the Aranya series will be starting okay, next week and we will go ahead and uh, continue the Aranya series where we are discussing environment syllabus entirety. Okay, if you haven't checked out already, go to the playlist of Study IQ English. We have completed what, four or five lectures and the rest coming up starting Monday. Uh, the coming Monday, which is what? I forget the date, but you understand it. Okay? So, which of the following is not a part of the alliance of small island states? So, you find that they have representation from Atlantic, from Pacific, from Indian Ocean, from South China Sea, from say major areas. Okay, so from South China Sea, you have Singapore, the lone contender. Okay. From Indian Ocean, you are looking at well, all of the other small, small islands besides Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is not a part of it. So, D. Okay. Kamlesh, good morning. How are you? Welcome. Welcome. Right. Question number three. Developed countries acknowledged their historical responsibility. Huh? Firstly, here it is. Now you should laugh at this statement. If they had acknowledged their historical responsibility, uh, well, then we wouldn't be having this class which means that they are taking efforts. No? If you have acknowledged your mistakes, you will try to rectify your mistake. This hasn't happened. Plus, 1000 billion dollars a year. Not possible. Not possible. So, incorrect. UNFCC owes its origin to Paris Climate Agreement. Like I told you, no. It owes its origin to Rio 1992 summit. Okay. And Conference of Parties owes its origin to UNFCC is absolutely correct. So, how many of the above are correct? Only one. One only. Right. Let's look at this. Which of the above is or are part of the criteria to determine critical minerals in India? Uh, recently in the news again, you had several different, uh, say, uh, what do you say, developments. Huh? Lithium first found in Jammu and Kashmir, Riasi district. Uh, then you had vanadium in the Gulf of Khambath. You had tantalum that was found in river Satlaj, right? And before this, you have had the Mines and Minerals Amendment Act that was passed by the government of India. Earlier, we had atomic minerals that were 12 in number. Now, six of them have been divested, okay? Which means private sector can also go ahead and take part in their exploration and mining. And government of India also released a list of 30 critical minerals. And why are they critical? Please understand, criticality is always time sensitive. What is critical today may not be critical tomorrow. For example, right now, solving questions for you is extremely critical. But after the prelims examination, there is no point solving MCQs because, well, the criticality is lost. Right? So, is it essential for economic development? Absolutely. For national security? Absolutely. Because you are looking at strategic minerals also. Right? which are essentially to do with minerals that are used in military domain. So, looking at uranium, thorium, all of those that you will be making your nuclear missiles from. And lesser polluting potential, absolutely no. Supply chain disruptions, you are looking at the Chinese example. Rare earth elements they control. What happens if your economy is deprived of these critical minerals? They go ahead and hamper your national sovereignty. They have hamper your economic development. Okay. Polluting potential has nothing to do with this. So, which means 1, 2 and 3. C is the answer here. Right. And the final question that I had for you from yesterday's class. Consider the following events during the evolution of the earth. So, I had given you a hint. That well, this is the story of earth as a ball of fire. And eventually becoming say the blue planet that we know of today. So, how did that happen? Okay, common sense apply. Karo. Right now, your earth is a hot ball of fire. It starts to cool down. The first event that happens 
is that all your material huh, that is there on the surface of the earth now starts to rearrange itself. Okay. And this rearrangement happens on what criteria? On what basis? It happens on the basis of density. Which is why, my friends, when you study the interior of the earth, huh, you find that my inner core, you all talk about it, no? Nife, 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 Nife hai bolte usko. Kyo bolte usko? Kyo gaya Nife udar? What happened? What caused all your heavy elements to go ahead and say descend down into a small ball? Why? Because of the process of differentiation which is nothing but your heaviest elements, your densest elements went ahead and descended deep into the earth's core and your less dense elements rose up. So this entire churn huh, that happened after the cooling of the earth is called as differentiation. What happens after the differentiation? The earth gets hit by solar winds and so thus your primordial atmosphere that was present, huh, your primordial atmosphere that was there, say hydrogen and helium, that is lost. Okay, so you have differentiation that happens first, then loss of primordial atmosphere happens. Okay, then you have your volcanoes that start erupting, and in the process of eruption, they give out vapor. So, this eruption of volcanoes is nothing but degassing. Okay, and this vapor that comes up eventually, you have volcanoes, you know, that give out vapor, vapor condense. You have oceans that are formed. First, blue-green blue, algae comes in, the first form of life on earth. Okay. And then they go ahead and use the say, necessary components to go ahead and engage in the process of photosynthesis. Right. So, what is the answer? First, you have density differentiation. Then you have the loss of primordial atmosphere. Then you have degassing and then eventually you have photosynthesis. Easy peasy. So, your answer being D. Very, very important. Huh? Students often go ahead and completely like overlook this section. Ki nahi nahi mujhe. I will start from say uh, understanding inner core of the earth. Then you are leaving a major part of your syllabus out at your own risk. Okay. Make absolute uh, certainty that your solar system, your evolution of the earth, evolution of the atmosphere of the earth and say the various other say uh, developments that have happened in the last year, your Lagrangian points, your different solar missions, space missions, all of that are on your fingertips. Very often asked by the UPSC in every other examination across India. Okay. Right. So, my star individuals who make sure that they answer the questions correctly, except I think the last question, the uh, differentiation degassing one, most of you have got, got the other questions correct. Okay. I expected that because again students often ignore the last question, last part of the discussion. Okay. Niraja, Bulbul, Eldo, Pooja, Crystal, Mandeep, Vaishnavi, Shubham, Shriram, Yathendra, Ruchira, Akhil, Studding Raccoon, Koder, Manoj, Ayush, Target CAC and Gatso. Well done fellows. Excellent job. Continue this effort. Continue this momentum. You know, uh, I am willing to go ahead and engage in this constructive discussion every morning so that you benefit out of this. Yes. The newspaper should not take you more than 90 minutes and at the end of it, if you are not solving questions, well, it's a moot exercise. Yes, you are cheating yourself. Right. On that note, I will uh, take your uh, leave, but not before I request all those of you who are watching to please leave me a like if you understood the three topics that we discussed today. And uh, I will see you in tomorrow's class that begins sharp at 7 a.m. Have a wonderful, productive day, my friends. This is Bhuvanapurvajha signing off. Namaskar. <laughs>